Welcome everyone to next UX Monday uh, here in amazing spaces of MSD Prague. If you're interested in what we are doing, please go to uh, either uxassociation.cz or to our meetup when you will receive regular newsletters about our upcoming events. We wouldn't be there if it wasn't for you, the community, on the first place. And on the second place, our sponsors. So I would like to thank so much to four, right now four, before that it was free, right now it's four, uh, of our sponsors, which is LMC, a longtime partner, uh, Project Man, again, long time partner, but not of the whole UX association, but right now they are. Uh, MSD, thanks for this amazing premises and amazing food. I don't know if you tried, I hope you did, and, there, uh, and I hope that there is still some food left, but it's so amazing food today. And uh, Sinner Shader, uh, which is our like last partner. Cool, let's see if this works. Yeah, okay. Hi everyone, Simon from Trezor here. A uh, quick question that you should always ask at any conference talk thing. Who has zero experience with crypto? Cool. Nice. All right. You are my target audience. Uh, everyone else will have, well, I can have a nap, we can relax. Anyway, uh, so we make these little devices. Someone here has never seen one before. Someone here. There we go. Someone at the back. Who had their hands up? Anyone else? Please give them back. <laughs> okay, so when they're, when they're turned off, they're kind of boring, but uh, that's great. They should be a little discrete devices. And what they do, they help you interact with Bitcoin, crypto, and all these kind of things securely. Um, but why do they exist? This gentleman is probably one of the most OGs of the OGs of the, of the Bitcoin or crypto world, is that he has this great quote. Bitcoin is at the stage of email, uh, was in the 90s, because uh, Bitcoin is actually super hard to use. We've come a long way since this quote, but the reason why he says this is because the foundation of Bitcoin is super solid. Like, it's on, built on the uh, heads and arms of, uh, of giants. So, if anyone's slightly interested in this, in this world, I recommend Googling Anatop or Andreas Bitcoin. He's super cool. He's probably one of the reasons why I got into Bitcoin. And he presents better than I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what do we do here? So Bitcoin and crypto introduces a pretty new concept called self-custody. Before 2008, self-custody wasn't really a well-known topic. Um, there were examples of self-custody. So if you held cash, you have custody of that cash. No one can take it off you. Yes, they can physically threaten you and whatnot, but you can hide it. You don't have to tell anyone where it is. Other examples were precious minerals like gold. You can, people would invest in gold, but you can actually ask to have custody of it. So you can get a gold dealer to bring it to your home or you can meet them on the street and you then have custody of it. And in theory, no one can really take it off you. But why does that matter? Because money, as we mostly know it, or mostly have experience with, is not in your custody. So if you have money in a bank, and you say, hey bank, I want to buy something on Alza, the bank allows you to buy something on Alza. And at any point in time, the bank can say, no, you don't have to, or you're not, you shouldn't, because the bank is the custodian of your money. And this is the topic that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies introduce, uh, where you are in control and are the sole proprietor or the owner of your money. So these little devices floating around, they basically hold one bit of information. And there it is. That's the secret. <laughs> uh, but what this is, is uh, a private key. And this starts the problems with crypto. Crypto is embedded with horrible terminology. This is technically accurate. This is a private key. From a cryptographic and maybe computer science point of view, it is entirely correct. But end users don't understand this. And this is what Trezor, 10 years ago, has, in, uh, let's say, tried to fix, let's say. So this key 
can be represented like this. These are called mnemonic codes, or also known as a seed phrase. And these 12 words can recompute your private key. Why is that important? If you get that treasure that's in your hands now, and you get a hammer and you smash it, if you backed it up with this piece of paper, you get another treasure, and your treasure is back to life, and you can access your coins. One common misunderstanding with our product is that how many bitcoins can I store in the Trezor? Well, unlimited. Technically, there's 21 million, but that's not the point. All you're storing is the key to your bitcoins. Bitcoins are stored on the blockchain, and all you have is one analogy, and it doesn't really work, but I'm going to try, is the private key is like a pen, and the pen signs checks, and the checks then gets cashed on the blockchain, but the pen cannot get out of the Trezor. That's why it's secure. So the moment this information gets onto the internet or someone takes a photo and sends it to their friends and these kind of bad practices, uh, we consider it compromised. And our little devices, this information never leaves the device. So a lot of security talk here. And security user experience is really hard. And this is where the first joke comes. It sucks. And it's a common thing. <laughs> so at Trezor, we have a, a core principle core principles, where right here is an equation, user experience, security, privacy. So user experience multiplied by security, multiplied by privacy. And if at any point in time, privacy is zero, the whole equation is, is void. So we are constantly fighting to make sure that everything is at level. So we actually have ways to increase security amazingly. But the user experience is shit. It just can't give this. It's not an acceptable product. So these are the levels we are constantly fighting. And what, I'm, what I will be showing is a case study where we managed to increase security, but unfortunately lowered user experience. So that's what it is. It's a, it's a technology called Passphrase, and where, where it's challenging for most users is that it's, it's not a password. So common internet experience would have password can be reset. What's my password? I forgot it. And there's a reset mechanism. But because you are the sole holder of your information, that private key, if you lose that, it's gone. There is no service or tool or way to get it back for you. And passphrases increases this to the next level in terms of security. So if you went back whoops, and you found these 12 words on the street, you could then put them into a trezor and collect this person's funds. But what passphrases do is it adds an unlimited combination of these. So for example, it's sometimes referred to as a 13th word. So I could, in theory, say number 13 is my mom's name. But I could have another account, and I could use my dad's name. So what we recommend to users, like in terms of best practice, is that these words are stored separately from your passphrase. But again, people get confused. I have 12 words, why would I need another one? And this is where trouble strikes. strikes. So it's great for security. Find these 12 words, um, and you still have another layer. Their privacy impact is kind of minimal. It has a very small privacy positive, but otherwise, in this situation, situation it's next to none. But it really hurts, uh, really hurts user experience. So what has happened? We have this term, which is probably one of the worst terms we throw around the office, and that's coin loss. Coin loss is when you essentially have lost access to your crypto, lost access to your Bitcoin. And unfortunately, this happens. And this is why we're here to talk about how we failed and how we're trying to fix. Here's a post from our uh, forum. And I'll only read the first two lines. It says, I'm stupid. I messed up my passphrase. Call me stupid, but I've seemed to have forgotten my passphrase. 
goes on, misunderstanding why the feature exists, what it's there for, and unfortunately this goes on and on. This quote from a user is actually quite fun because they found it so easy to use, but they didn't know why it existed, and of course now they're pissed off that their funds are gone. If we already have our seed words, why the hell do we want to add one more word? Now, why are people struggling with this? So this is a simplified version of our onboarding. So if you get the new Trezor and you plug it in, you need to install the app, install firmware, create a new wallet, set up a standard wallet, backup, begin backup, write down 12 words, check words, continue to pin, set pin, confirm pin, activate cons, com complete setup, label device, access suite, and then you set up a passphrase. And what we did when we introduced this, we were like so excited, we solved the way for people to protect their coins if someone finds their 12 words. But we didn't tell them how to use it. So what happens if you set up this whole process, we give you two little boxes and basically it sucks. <laughs> so uh, imagine now you set up your Trezor and you've come to this little screen that says, do you want a standard wallet, a wallet or a hidden wallet? We generally recommend it as an advanced feature. And luckily only 10% people use the hidden wallet. Uh, the first time you're using it, we give you one more prompt and say, hey, are you sure you want to do this? This account you haven't used before, you know, I understand the passphrase cannot be retrieved, which is very soft landing, unfortunately. So we came up with uh, a, 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 a research case study where we wanted to shift the priority, but we still want to push the advanced security nature of it. So we still want it discoverable, but when people fall into it, we want them to, be, to understand it. So we want to uh, get users to have an intentional bias that, okay, this is here, but it's advanced, so I need to spend some time understanding it. Uh, a colleague uh, recently had a user interview with a user, an experienced crypto user, and described that for them, understanding the whole crypto landscape is like a new language. And it's one of the disadvantages of crypto in general, because you are the sole person responsible, there's no way out, you really have to do some study. Now there are, let's say, competitors out there, but they're in different spaces. So if you have ever heard of places like Coinbase and Kraken, they offer some sort of crypto services, but they are the custodians. You don't have self-custody. And they get to get away with these nice services, but one day if the taxman comes to them or the government raises them, they can be shut down and you can lose access to your funds. So when people, again, take custody, they assume a lot of responsibility. And unfortunately, this message is not, is not so clear from us. So here are the research questions we posed. So we wanted to make sure we had the vocabulary pretty sweet. We want to make sure they understand the best practices, the, uh, the potential risks. It kind of sucks, but we want people to know, understand how it works. So often, like, who knows how email works? You don't have to explain, it just kind of works. But we, we feel our users have a leg up when they understand how the technology works. Of course, we want discoverability. We want them to be able to switch from somewhere that's hidden and not, or passphrase or not. And of course, access their funds. So I'll run through some screens and what we had some quick learnings. So right here is, is a mock-up of ours that we done with Figma. <coughs> and what we asked the first uh, screen here is we imagine you're in a case where you've see, received a newsletter from us and we advise you there's a new technology offered to you called passphrase. How would you find it? So we failed so hard because up here there's a thing called passwords and this has nothing to do with anything. It was like a prototype of a prototype of a prototype and unfortunately we gave this to users to test and uh, a US, UX researcher, myself, and a designer all missed this. So 
when everyone says, ah, oh, passwords, that seems like the right thing, and they click it and nothing works because it was a silly prototype. Luckily, most people found in the top left there's a connected my trezor, and that was the next step. We also had a call to action in the bottom, but no one picked up on that. So now, now we're going. So now we advise people, create a new passphrase. And they all seem to progress. They create new. And now we go into some sort of like introduction, some sort of small education steps, which was quite cool. Most people understood this is kind of like heavy information. I need to sit down and pay attention. So, you know, the introduction to what I'm about to do right now, it's very important. It's also for newbies. But then we had people in the middle, and they're like, don't lose or forget it. No one can help. This is crazy. So the, the message got through, but for my liking, it was a little bit too scary. We want people to consider it, but not be scared of it. This was great. So at the, at the end of the, the information, the little steps, we asked people a quiz, a very simple quiz. So if I lose or forget my passphrase, can I call Trezor to forget it? Again, I don't have the numbers in mind, but our users were pretty pretty sure, like, you know, uh, no, you're on your own. If you lose your Trezor, they, uh, sorry, if you lose your passphrase, Trezor can't help you. But, of course, as users are users, some people thought this was a setup. They thought they can opt in. Oh, this is great. Trezor can help me find it. Yes, I want them to help me recover. So again, an unexpected surprise here when you're so sure of yourself that this is the way. Um, there's always something wrong. Yes, and this was the feedback. I just assumed it was a choice I could make. Amazing. So we, we had a reputation. When we introduced passphrases, we, we basically threw it in people's faces and we told them nothing about it. And we're, I think we're a little bit addicted to this pattern because we did it again. On this screen, we added some new functionality and didn't tell users anything about it. We had this remember wallet functionality so you can use your application without plugging in your Trezor. No idea. We had a discrete mode, so similar to when you have a banking application so you can't see your balance. Again, people had no idea what that meant. So even though we're like on the right path to solving one problem, we just invented new ones. Getting, getting towards the end, and when you create a new passphrase, so you're, you want to get this next layer of security, so if you lose your 12 words, or someone finds your 12 words, you still have this backup, we, we prompt you, say, hey, we can see you're, gonna use, you're using this new passphrase, we wanna make sure it's the right thing. So you, we will ask you to confirm, because it can happen, you can mistype it. If you mistype it by one letter, you jump into a new passphrase, and then things can get confusing very quickly. Our users, oh, sorry, during the test, users were, okay, this is cool, like it's just like triple checking what's up, and then you had the users who don't read, because users don't read. Like, what are, what are you talking about, empty wallet? You already told me I'm setting one up. Why are you pushing, me, pushing this shit on me again? So it's, it's quite fun when you get stuck. Yes, and now, so this, this is a screen where a user has successfully set up um, a passphrase wallet. So this is like the, the normal flow, sometimes we call it standard. There's no passphrase, you go in. If, so, if, if for whatever reason someone found your 12 words, you'd be directly pulled into this account. And then people can optionally opt in for a passphrase wallet. So during the flow, we ask people, create a passphrase wallet, and now what do you think of this screen? 50-50 got it, but the, the, of course the fun ones were like, okay, I created a passphrase wallet, so why the hell are you showing me two options? Like, I just, I just decided I want this. Why can there be two? What we, where we failed is passphrases are unlimited. So like I said before, I can set a passphrase for my mother, I can, using my mother's name, I can set up a passphrase for using my fa uh, father's name, and it's unlimited, so we're still a little bit sucky at doing this. So this is the this is the results of our of our research. Didn't quite nail the vocabulary, 
We've got some messages down, but not everything. People were understanding the risks and the best practices that if I lose my passphrase, I can, I'm screwed. <laughs> uh, they get the idea how it works. They manage to discover it apart from our mishap. But switching between it and getting access to funds was quite tough. So, so security user experience sucks. So, some very high level thoughts. Uh, I use the term foot guns a lot. Like you can shoot yourself in the foot. And it's very, at least from my point of view, I very easily get complacent in, in the crypto world, in the Bitcoin world, that you know people should just understand, but not everyone's gonna take the time to invest. So, of course, if there's an opportunity for something to go wrong, it will go wrong at least once. Increasing security is never free, and it kind of ties into the next point. Increasing security naturally inherits more complexity, but the complexity is never gone. It's just shifted. And now when I was talking about uh, self-custody, that complexity actually lands on the responsibility of the user. So the user now <laughs> typically used to logging into some amazing service and which has two-factor authentication and whatnot, now all that responsibility is on themselves. So whenever we take, take advantage of some cool technology, the complexity goes up and we need to counter that with the right user experience. And failing with people's money hurts a lot. We unfortunately get a lot of messages from people who just didn't know, who misunderstood the purpose of a passphrase or other similar technology. And yeah, it sucks. It's like, it's like burning money. And because the difficulty is, is with, with Bitcoin, you can actually still, it'll be forever there on the blockchain. So you can say, you know, I put that money there, but I can't get it out. So we are doing what we can so this doesn't happen in the future. And that's it. Any questions? That was a fast question. Thank you. Early in the beginning, you show quite a complex user journey mm. until you can you know, start using it properly. Uh, is it connected to like first time users uh, and their conversion to being the real users? Yeah. Have you tracked that? And was it among one of your like goals to hit some number or was it completely like off? Uh, like going back to the establishment of the passphrase feature, I think we completely like missed the whole onboarding experience, uh, like first time Trezor user. So if you were to use, if you're an existing Trezor user and we introduce passphrases, you would just uh, see passphrase pop up and it wouldn't, it ideally wouldn't be that intimidating because you're sort of used to it, you can escape and just go to the standard wallet. Uh, but I feel, like this is before my time, but. Uh, I feel what happened was we completely skipped passphrases during onboarding. So there was, we already had this long chain of events and why not throw one more uh, res responsibility to the, to the end user. How, uh, how important is the metric of the onboarding uh, going through for the users important for you? Because it's very important for like a digital design because the users can drop off yep. and you lose money. But in your case, you need to buy the device beforehand. Yes. So I, I think like the motivation to finish the whole onboarding is, is, is very high because yes. you already bought the device. Yes. So yes, yes. how this metric is like important for you? We don't necessarily, we, we do measure it, but we do have this unique advantages that people have already bought it. And one interesting persona is people will buy and they're like, oh, it's too hard put it in a drawer, two years later, open the drawer and go, maybe I'll try today. So um, the, the metric is not so hard, but in terms of onboarding, uh, we, we, we suffer in certain times of, of the market. So right now in the Bitcoin world, we're in a bull a bear market, so the price is quite low. And, we, and our activity is actually quite busy when the price goes up. So when the price goes up, people get excited, they want to buy Trezor, they pull out their Trezor from their drawer, blow off the dust and they start using it. So the metrics that we're interested in is uh, support. How many support requests we get for people who are unable to onboard themselves. Uh, so yeah, onboarding for us, like we, our, our core of the business is we want people to be sovereign and 
if they can't do that with our technology, then we fail them. So I don't really have a direct answer to your to the metric, but it has a side effect on other parts of the business. Hi, uh, I have a question about the pass phrase itself. It's more, uh, do you think there is a uh, other method that could be used instead of pass phrase in the future, like that would uh, shorten the user journey, like some kind of a digital fingerprint or this kind of method, and it would be uh, for sure, yeah, making it more easier for someone that know nothing. Yeah, so um, there is a very simple way, like, like I said, it can be treated as a 13th word. So if they just wrote on our, like on the card that comes in, we could have a little sign that said passphrase and just write it down and then it's the same. So when they open it up and they need to recover it, they can just do passphrase. But uh, at the end of the day, passphrase is just a little bit of information. We could put some sort of biometric information in there as long as it would fit. Uh, it has a limit of 50 characters, but some sort of identifier there. Um, but we have to make sure that the biometric is consistent. So if someone is like using a fingerprint or something on a different phone, they might use a slightly, the end result might be a slightly different biometric. So personally, I'm quite cautious with this. Text is awfully consistent. I'm wondering about prioritization of your work, mm -hmm. adding new features <laughs> to the treasure itself. Mm -hmm. And if you are sometimes in the trap of adding new features because new te technology is emerging, but the need is not there, mm. maybe yet. Mm -mm -mm. Do you work there? You ask really direct questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, like at least in the industry-wise, we're, we're known as quite conservative in terms of adding new technologies. Uh, and we've been burnt. So one thing about the crypto ecosystem is there's camps of people. So kind of like Apple and, I, and Android and iOS, people stick to their camps and they stay that way. Some people only swear by Bitcoin and nothing else. Some people love every other combination of technology. So we don't necessarily jump onto every bandwagon. We are let's say we call ourselves a Bitcoin first company. So if there's technology around Bitcoin that can enhance, we, we will quite be interested in that. And CoinJoin is one of them. Lightning is something we're also talking about now. So um, from our, in, in our eyes, uh, there has to be like some sort of a market demand. And if there's like a real, like it has to be a safe investment from us. And I don't necessarily be in money. We have added support for some technologies which are actually not used anymore. So we've invested in it, and now we're actively removing it from our product. So there have been some minor cryptocurrencies called, I don't know, I don't know one comes to mind as POZ, and it's gone, it's dead. The project died, and we essentially had to waste our time twice, once to put it in and once to take it out. So uh, particularly, we are quite cautious, but our motivation as a company is actually not necessarily the latest and greatest, but actually the next... Uh, generation of crypto users. So uh, we want to promote self-custody. So if you have your Bitcoin on Revolut or some platform like that, we would like you to store it on somewhere like a Trezor. So this target is what we're looking for next. So ease of use is actually quite critical to what we're doing. This is why we, want it. we need to fix our passphrases. How big is your team and how do you cooperate? cooperate well with my team. <laughs> uh, so in terms of product, uh, please colleagues help me out. Uh, product managers, we have like three, four product managers. Design team is slowly growing. We have five, six designers. Re research team is three people. So a uh, couple more, I'd say, yeah, we've had everyone together. So our product team is like 14, 15 people. Yeah. Are you hiring right now? Uh, is the answer yes, wrong? Yeah, we're always hiring. <laughs> <laughs> Good, perfect. Uh, who's the main target group of Trezor? So uh, we have a nickname for this persona. We call them Eddie, the exchange coiner. So they, they store their cryptocurrency on uh, crypto exchanges, Binance, Coin, Coinbase, and we want them to take custody because it's not safe. Nice. Finally, I understand the difference between face phrase and seed phrase. Pass phrase, seed phrase. Yeah. 
I thought they were actually the same thing. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. You learn new that's stuff, a, that's Michael. A, that's a win. <laughs> how long does it take to develop a new feature and how many user testing it usually takes? Uh, it's an impossible question to answer. Um, like CoinJoin took years, years of work. Um, we, we were testing one technology called Submarine Swaps, which was mixing Bitcoin and Lightning, and we threw it in the bin. But for example, I, I've been working on Ethereum staking, like, I, 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 it takes a long time. I don't have an answer. <laughs> okay, this was the final question. I will have one more, one yeah, more yeah, yeah. just between the two yes. of us. Uh, have you ever like failed in UX so hard that it cost your customers money? Yes, coin, okay. coin loss. Coin yes, loss. that's okay. our terminology. Yeah. Okay, it's unfortunate. Yes. And uh, are you like um, insured about uh, like no. that? No, this is uh, like I don't know how much fun this is, but like we always get sued for for this kind of information. So often, uh, often it's by uh, ma malicious actors. So uh, our email database got leaked, and then p someone took advantage and spammed all our users to convince them to give up their 12 words. If they had a passphrase, it would have been fine. And yeah, people are trying to sue us, saying that it's our responsibility, so forth. Um, from a technical point of view, like from a legal point of view, I understand that our terms and conditions, you know, absolve us of any responsibility. But this is this is the problem with the ecosystem is that people are sort of jumping in too blindly, and they need to be responsible for their actions. Like, I don't know if this analogy works, but like, getting into Bitcoin is a little bit like driving a car. You need to get a license first. It's not so obvious the first time. You might know about it, but you need to invest some of your own time into this. But it's fun, it's cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Simon you. Malas from Trezor. <laughs> okay, so now it's time for another gentleman. And I'm very happy that Oliver is here. Uh, it's still in the area of security, cyber security, uh, but the sprinkle over it is AI, uh, which is a hot topic uh, in these days. So without further ado, please clap and welcome, uh, welcome Oliver. Hey, hi, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, didn't expect that many people. I've never been here. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I love your shirt. And I love ramen very much. Uh, Simon was a nice presentation. And uh, as you said, s AI and uh, Bitcoin, like cryptocurrency, are the hot topics. It doesn't matter if it's a UX conference or any other conference or whatever. So we covered the first one. I'll cover the second one. We're all good. Um, yeah, um, so I hope it will be helpful for you, the presentation. Um, I had just one project, recent project, matching the criteria of the um, of the topic. So, yeah, hope you will like it. So, first of all, before we start, um, I'll say a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Oliver. I work in a company called Sentinel One. Um, how many of you knows uh, know Sentinel One? Yes, somebody. So, uh, yeah, I love the company. I'm there for a year and a half. Um, seems to be much longer, but um, yeah, love it so far. Um, and uh, I'm leading the establishment of the Czech design team. Um, this is the last line. I tried to rewrite it with AI because it sounded stupid. I like design systems. But so I just wanted to say that I like design systems. And um, I like ideation phases of the projects very much like the 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 the, the beginning the the startup phase when it just you know when it just uh bring the idea somebody else brings another idea you try to break it they try to break yours so this is my favorite part and i started in czech technical university um so personal stuff i'm 33 i like traveling um i built a really really old house 
Yeah, and I do music, so follow my band. Uh, for context, uh, the thing that we're going to be talking about today is a little bit more technical. It's like a cybersecurity, uh, a little bit deeper. Uh, I try to remove everything that is like too much. Uh, so I hope I didn't oversimplify it. And uh, just first of all about Sentinel One. If somebody doesn't know what what type of company is this, it's a cybersecurity um, endpoint protection uh, cybersecurity company. We are um, um, used by um, leading enterprises like banks, huge companies governments and uh, even NASA um, for to, to respond to cyber attacks and uh, um, we are doing that well. Uh, for the this presentation, oh yeah, wait. The first, uh, it's a first security AI, AI platform and it's the result of this presentation, which is amazing. And uh, our main persona for this project is a security uh, operations center analyst. Uh, SOC analyst, and um, I think I underestimated him. Like, I think I had to prepare another slide to explain who this guy is. But it's a security guy working in the office, coming in the morning to the office, turning on the computer, uh, studying Sentinel One, uh, our console, and trying to uh, investigate uh, or prevent the attacks. And so we're going to be talking about him. Um, oh, I got a clicker, I forgot. So uh, now close to the project about the approach. Um, first of all, I wanted to start with a disclaimer. Uh, so the content presented here is not the final product of Sentinel-1. It just is just an ideation phase. It was just a very nice um, ideation part of the project that I said at the beginning, I really enjoy them. And uh, it's not like, uh, it's just my opinions, it's just my approach and uh, that's it. So, uh, what happened? I was in the office, we had lots of projects, and uh, um, everybody was occupied, and also we had uh, some holidays in Tel Aviv, because our second biggest office, or the first biggest office actually, is in Tel Aviv. Uh, and um, so they were on holidays, in the States nobody was available, they were on vacations, and so they came to me like, we have a product idea. We need, we need Typo, sorry. We have to integrate AI into our platform, and there is a deadline. Like there is some some event we really want to do it in time. So, and um, it's like okay, let's think what we can do. So uh, bless you. Ideation. Uh, we started thinking like what's the most painful things for users because security analysts. It's like it's a nerdy stuff. Like, like there are there are so many flows, so many tools and everything and like they are very complicated like i'm in this company for a year and a half doing these interfaces i still have no idea about some of the stuff like that's happening there so it's like but what's the most painful things for users what would like who would use the ai tool and uh like where it can be utilized so we started discussing these questions and um um uh, it was a it was a really short uh, project for me. Um, after we launched it, or like launched the initial phase, um, all people came back, and so it um, it got like some people assigned, like full time designers who are now working on this. But for me, it was short, so we weren't talking too much. We were just trying, ideating. But before we continue, is there anybody who knows Splunk? Just a few of us. Okay. Um, I'll get a drink. So Splunk is an amazing tool that allows you to go through your logs uh, fast, basically, if, if you simplify it. Uh, just imagine, have you ever worked with like database, for example, MySQL, you know, trying opening it in a notepad? How much time does it take? It's like your, your Mac is just like pfft, dead. And now just imagine looking for something through like millions of terabytes of logs, impossible. And as a security analyst, you sometimes have to check on, for example, all of the entries or events in logs of all of the um, devices connected from China, and you have to do it fast. And so 
Splunk does that, and uh, um, it's, a, it's an American software company in San Francisco, super successful. And so um, this is how it looks like. Lots of filters, uh, complicated stuff, lots of tables, lots of tables. Um, and uh, so we have a similar, similar functionality in uh, Singularity XDR, which is a part of our platform. And uh, it allows you to investigate like through these logs, also as Splunk does, and uh, recre recreate a chain of events that happened as, a, as, an, as an analyst. It's basically you, you investigate looking through it. Um, and uh, there are a few downsides of this. Uh, do you always know where to look? There are so many events, like it's enormous. And uh, it's not that like, you, it's not that easy even to look through it because you have to know how to write like query language in query language. And uh, even if you know, do you want to? Uh, do you have time for that? To, just to write like really complicated query queries there in query language. And so we were thinking that this can be a good candidate, how to simplify it, like for the beginnings. And um, so these are the challenges of our main persona for this. Uh, long alert queues requires thousands of investigation hours lately to analyst burnout. Complex system administration, um, not enough time for proactive threat hunting to catch risk, and talent shortage because you have to really skilled to use this tool. And um, if we can maybe integrate AI uh, tool there, it can help you. You can be less skilled and do same job. Um, and so um, I won't be going too much into details of discovery and everything. Just it's just shortly, uh, we were discussing a lot for lots of hours. What's even possible? Uh, also, what can be the entry point? Because for example, you saw the screen of Splunk, like we have the same tool, it's also like you, you have to work with the table, or do you? Um, you have to work with these filters, you have to represent the information somewhere, it's not chat GPT where like this communication is the main thing that you're looking for. Um, you need to see the data, and so what's gonna be the entry point? How do we wanna show it? And uh, what, what's, the, what's the scope? How much we can deliver in just a few weeks? Um, and, uh, so in two weeks, um, I designed 12 primary concepts. It means 12 uh, different concepts with all prototypes, with all of the micro interactions. We always came like, uh, meet with the developers and we always dropped it because we found a better solution. So 12 primary concepts. And uh, um, we were talking about many things like why which you want to use AI, uh, when would you want to use AI? Um, should it be combined with the main search? Because you saw, you saw the Splunk, they have like the search panel on top, and uh, would you still want to use it? Uh, should it be like, or should it be combined with AI? And can it be combined and still be used not for AI searches and so on? Can you still be, like, do you want to combine it also with the, with the queries, uh, query uh, language? And, um, yeah, and so these kind of questions, and uh, uh, the ideation was the best part because we had even the top management of the company, which like it's a big deal for me, especially because I never worked with them. Like TO, we were like uh, texting in the night. They were just sending me ideas on a napkin. This is the real picture of a real lap napkin that I received in the middle of the night one day, and uh, it was cool. Uh, we were exploring our limitation. We were working with developers, with AI specialists building and trying and uh, yeah, prototyping stuff. Um, also, one of the problem was the, how much time would it take to answer because as I said, we were working with these logs and these logs are enormous. So it takes time to process the information to generate some meaningful output. And so I just wanted to share the initial result uh, this is like, doesn't matter. But before we go further, this is again Splunk, how it looks like, how our tool uh, used to look like. And this is uh, what we came to. Um, 
the AI guys, um, they found a way how to, like for AI to recognize what are you typing. So you don't even have to switch between the queries and the normal language. And uh, yeah, so on top of this, when you're looking for something like, give me, for example, search for um, some stuff, it can like, can we provide something in addition to this, like, can we suggest you the next questions, like something you may want to be looking for if you looked for this according to what you found there. And so we are working on this stuff and uh, it's there. And also, can we suggest by the AI some actions that you can take according to what you found in this data? And just imagine if that would work, you could like just it would be so 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 easier to find employees for this stuff, you know. Uh, so yeah, this is how it looked like. This is an example of uh, the query language. If you didn't know how it looks like, like this, uh, pretty much boring. And yeah, so that was the result. But um, it's not how it looks right now. It was just an initial initial phase. Um, it was just the beginning. Then I. Um, um, started working on something else, and we have two brilliant designers from State who are working on the final concept. And uh, this wasn't uh, very helpful through the like whole application because like they have complicated uh, workflows, security analysts, and um, so this was just focused on one part. So yeah, so conclusions and uh, challenges designing for AI. First of all getting the most out of it. Can we automate? Can we suggest actions? Can we suggest questions? That was very problematic. And not only this, basically, all of this takes a lot of time to generate. So how can you uh, like make the user waiting and still have it like seamless somehow? So balancing with this was hard. So instead of like looking for the answer and then started generating like additional questions and actions we had to do everything at the same time so we can show it like um, faster and so yeah long waiting time and what we can do i don't know what we uh yeah you don't know what you're getting and so in interfaces it's it's nice to know what kind of answer you can receive and so when i was designing till like, the last few late latest few days of the project i thought the answer will be like a few lines of like, yes, no, here is the data, here is the stuff. And then we realized it's not enough. So we started digging, digging deeper. And just a day before the presentation, before the output should be ready and working, including coding, we realized that we are getting uh, like four pages of text. I'm like, okay, oh my God. <laughs> and uh, it, it, like, it makes a difference. And uh, it, it makes a difference, especially for your layouts there because as i said before it's like a, it's a big page and uh you have to work with the table and uh so you cannot take the whole page with this text enormous text and also if you would take a half we still want to present after uh the the additional questions that also can get longer they also can have like two lines uh like or actions and so this was a really complicated stuff that I didn't know, we didn't know what we're going to receive from AI. And uh, I was a little bit scared about this because it was like, it was presented on a conference and it wasn't like we didn't have like a script and planned questions and anybody in the audience who was like on our side just to ask the right question. So it was really trained AI. So people could come and ask for something and we didn't know uh, what way they're going to break it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, um, and um, yeah, so working with the query language within the same input can be very long too. So like there was a very advanced logic of how the size of the top part and the bottom part was changing according to the amount of content that we are getting and this kind of stuff. So and lessons learned for me, uh, first of all, the best opportunities are rarely, rarely planned. <laughs> and be micro ambitious. So um, I liked how Tim Minchin once said, I don't know if anybody knows Tim Minchin, I love this guy. 
he said uh, in one of his speeches to be micro ambitious because we are planning to be successful in this stuff, we are growing our career and go there and go there, but sometimes life just gives you an opportunity and this so far was a, a coincidence and it was like one of my uh, best project in my life. I loved it very much. So be open to stuff. It's very cool. Um, also, everything is achievable when you work with open-minded people. You see it very often in your jobs, probably. Sometimes you come to an engineer saying like, okay, I got this stuff, we have to do that. And he's like, okay, this is, this is, not, this is not simple, uh, but what if we can do it this way? And they try to find for ways they're trying to come up with some ideas how it can be delivered. And this is important to be like open-minded and willing to look for ways instead of uh, just saying no when you don't know exactly how it can be done. And so this was one of the examples for me. And it's important to have these people on the project because if you don't have them on the project, does it make sense after all? Like, So yeah, uh, also not everything has to be done by the book. Uh, it's important because we didn't do like a proper design sprint, for example, just uh, with a proper validation and this kind of stuff. We just um, did all of the validation internally. We just had like hundreds of calls with everybody, with all of the analysts internal, with top management. But it's like, yeah, um, um, our time is precious. And um, I'm saying this because in this case, like it can and will automate thousands and thousands of hours of people lives and sometimes people don't want to automate but sometimes like we are we we just are used to something and i have a great example of this my uh cousin he's a captain on a huge ship with containers and uh when he was on the position of the how's it called the the, the who's the hell helping the captain the second guy like uh cdo <laughs> basically and so he was like he started working there and after a few years he realized that like 95% of his job can be automated and it's just sad because like like at least half of the project like most m most of the work that these people were doing on the ship could be automated but they didn't want to he tried to like integrate this in, in into their daily lives trying to suggest the ways how like let's do this better let's do this better but sometimes people just don't want to. They know how to do something, and for them it's a stable point. Because like, I know this, I'm good at this, I will be doing this. So sometimes it's like, it makes sense to step, um, make a step out of the comfort zone because you can automate a lot of stuff. Um, there are limitations uh, of what can be fixed within, yeah, and other stuff. Like there are limitations what we can fi fix with a nice UI, but like, Technologies are growing fast, and it's it's very nice that we have them. And um, communication is the virtue. It was like the project for me for, was um, an important because it um, it was teaching me the whole time like that it's it's important to over communicate. So you better share your ideas. And uh, yeah. And so just a sneak peek of how it looks right now. Um, Actually, it wasn't shown to the world ever before. It will be on the conference that is taking place uh, in States this week, but markets and department allowed me to show this. So uh, first of all, this is how it looks like. My version wasn't, was focused just on one part of the product. But as I said, SOC analysts are investigators. Like something happened, for example, they go somewhere, they take a clue. They put the clue in the pockets, they go somewhere else, they take another clue, and they try to investigate, looking for the threat, how it happened, how ca what, what can we do to prevent this? And so this tool now helps to achieve this. You have different notepads, and you can like investigate different incidents that happened there and uh, go back to them because you can investigate more of them. And it's pretty cool. And this tool helps you to, like with basically every part of the of our platform nowadays, or will be. And uh, yeah, so threat response, auto investigations, system configuration, threat hunting, and investigations, which basically are the main um, core journeys for uh, tasks 
for a security analyst that they have, which is kind of cool. And uh, just another picture, you can generate the report when you solved something, when you found like the uh, and mitigated some issue or some thread. And yeah, that's pretty cool. And um, thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Oliver. Thanks. And now it's time for the question from the audience. So please raise your hand if you have any question. And if not, I will ask instead of you. OK, Simon, come on. L let's get it. Now it's a tradition. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about monitoring of the outputs of the AI? Uh, because it can change in time. How do you work with it? And um, what's the process after it? Uh, yeah, so um, we have a special team dedicated to this uh, who is sitting in Tel Aviv and uh, it's their main task to teach it, to navigate in the right direction, to make sure that um, it's, it's, uh, it's performing correct. So I'm not that much into uh, AI. I don't know it that good. I just wanted to present a nice project. But yeah, we have guys who are better at it. <laughs> nice answer. Uh, okay, another one. Okay, we have two. Fight. Thanks. Uh, while designing the, uh, for AI, were you also involved in, <coughs> sorry, uh, designing the conversation or pretty much just the space where the conversation happens? Uh, conversation, you mean the answers from yeah, the, the AI? Yeah, the tone, anything of that sort. Uh, yeah, we spent quite some time on types of the answers that are, uh, that like analyzing how meaningful in it will be for the analysts, talking to analysts, uh, asking like, because also our expectations of, of what is useful for them um, were different than it was. So yeah, it was based on the input from the analysts themselves. Also, uh, their input was very helpful with, even with the space, for example, because for me, I was like, yeah, the main stuff, like the more, most important thing is like to show this table, the output, but is it actually like they, they will check on the first result and most of the, the rest of the results will be mostly the same with like just small similarities and differences, um, depends on the case. And so, yeah, that was helpful. It was based on the um, feedback. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. I wanted to ask what kind of AI or what AI model did you use for this? I'm not sure if I can share that. <laughs> okay, uh, is it your own or your ju you just integrated some existing model? I'm not sure if I can share that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, how did you solve the long waiting time from the youth perspective? Yeah, it was, uh, first of all, um, we decided, it was like in a long journey, but it was kind of interesting thing. So we we asked. We were. We started asking a few questions simultaneously. One question is more simple to give just a summary uh, answer. Uh, so it was like generated, like for like ten seconds, let's say, which is still long, but like it's it's a lot of data. And even without AI, it it was taking to generate the output like for sometimes minutes, you know. Uh, so um, it was giving us the first answer, and it continued thinking all the time. So. While I'm reading the summary, it already provided me with uh, additional um, uh, feedback. And then you still like have time to analyze at least the beginning of it. Or if you're not interested, you're already looking at, at the result, right? And right from the beginning, we're analyzing the summary and suggested actions and suggested additional questions. So when I get to the content, actually, it already could present me what, what I can do next. But yeah, that's. That's how it was back then. Now, we'll see when it's released. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. It's a little bit of a silly question, but so that you your text input could either be like a query language or it could be like a spoken language and the AI would respond. I'm assuming the AI would respond with like a query language which yes. you can use. So does that mean that AI is potentially training the humans on how to use itself? <laughs> I love this one. Um, basically, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who is? Yeah. Over there. 
Okay, so maybe I missed this, and apologies for that. Um, but I wonder, in the like in the first place, what was the intent to start using this AI tool versus the table? So, for example, the table we use we want to want when we want to compare data, right? And, and similar intents. But now I'm trying to understand if we are more like designing the conversational thing to re sorry, re replace the with the table. What was the reason for that, right? Well, like, like we weren't trying to, yeah, thank you very much. And nice to see you, by the way. Uh, we weren't trying to uh, replace the table. Uh, but first of all, we were trying to give an additional option how to use uh, the query uh, to find some data you're looking for. Because like, even if you know how to use it, you may be not like expert in it. And this allowed you to like really be able to find for everything. The second thing, it allowed you to s find some stuff you didn't know you you have to be looking for. You could ask, like, give me, do, do we have some malicious uh, activity from China? It analyzed everything. It gave you the malicious activity. Otherwise, it would spend like hundreds of hours. And also, you can be not super good analyst, or you can be good analyst, but you couldn't decide. And this thing can could analyze the output and give you suggestions what sh you should do with them with the result also like even if you would find everything yourself it gives you hundreds or thousands of millions of lines with the results what's next it's like okay i'll be investigated so what are the similarities of these things and you will have to be opening one by one uh, and checking like what's there what's the similar stuff between all of them what why why are they there or creating exclusions or including something and investigating there instead of spending again hundreds of times you could just ask simple ask can you show me what's the similarities done in a minute thank you i'm curious about onboarding of the new users on one hand i am i can imagine that you will lose some of your hardcore users in the long run, because it will be more dump in a way, in a way, uh, for for the users. Uh, but my question uh, is about the newcomers mm -hmm. who has not so deep understanding of the cybersecurity going into the product itself. How do you onboard them when you can't print like the long manual covering everything possible? Because it is possible. That's the point. Uh, we kept it there. Uh, you still can type uh, query code. It will understand uh, automatically that you're not asking the idea of writing the query code. Mm -hmm. It were understanding what exactly you're trying to say to do automatically. And uh, according to onboarding, um, we have uh, one um, positive thing for us. We are a professional software. Uh, and so these people are being taught how to use it. Uh, it's not like they just come there, uh, like, you know, randomly appeared through through Google and it's like, okay, what should I do there? They are like professionals who are spending like their lives using it. So this is just the add-on. They know the query, but it's just, you know, um, it's a, it's a, it's going to be probably a paid feature. So they even won't have to have it, let's say. <laughs> I'm curious about the future generation, if they will be still so, uh, like, knowledgeable about the problem. Yeah, or we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> Where it goes. Okay, so we have a question from Slido. Do you enjoy ideation even when it means being given a hammer and looking for nails? We want to integrate AI. Or do you prefer to start with a problem? Oof. Both stuff are cool. It just depends on how interesting it is. How cool are the nails and the hammer or how cool is the problem? I had a small crisis um, like three years ago. Like I'm doing this for 15 years. I was like, okay, it's done. I'm bored now. Like I started hating this stuff and I went to some company. I was working there, product company, really cool company to be honest. But after half a year stuck on the same product, I was like, I mean, you know, it's boring. But then I realized it's just, it just, it's just about the idea, just about the product, to have the right people there, to have the right thing that you really believe in. And uh, we all kind of know that, you know? We, let's like, like, 
I like my project, but do you really love it? Do you really like the stuff you're doing? And for me, it was like really hard. I was, I, I didn't have an interesting project that I really loved for like years till now. And so, yeah, that's, that's the answer if, if it works. Thank you. Any additional questions? Yes. Final question from Shimon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how they're working with the trust uh, of the users into the AI? Because they need to trust that the AI will bring them the outputs, what they are looking for. They can't see the background. If you have table, it's very easy to analyze if all the results are there. Are there. How are you building the trust? Um, we'll be building. Uh, for now, it's just uh, uh, new stuff. Um, but uh, first of all, I had a feature there that allowed you to translate uh, your questions to question into a query. So even if it gave you some output, you could check for what's what was there on the background, what was generated by the AI, so we can be sure that it found everything you were looking for. And the second stuff, um, it gave you uh, the cho uh, the choice to like what to do with the data, and yeah. So that's that's the only thing for now. <laughs> we'll see how it goes next. Um, I'm not, yeah, not that much involved in, in this right now. Amazing. Thank you, Oliver. Applause, please. Thank you very much. <laughs>